Major Mark Nooch was the commander of the Operational Detachment Alpha, or ODA, 595. They were one of the first two 12-man teams to arrive in Afghanistan. It was 39 days after the 9-11 attacks when a Special Operations Chinook helicopter landed in a remote section of the Darasuf Valley in northern Afghanistan. Once the ramp on the rear dropped, the 12-man Special Forces team and two Air Force combat controllers grabbed their gear and supplies and rushed out. After a quick scan to see if nothing was left behind, the rear closed and the helicopter took off. Total time of the insertion? Less than one minute. This was the beginning of a daunting mission. Welcome to the Spy Network. After a quick scan into the dark landscape, soldiers of the Afghan Northern Alliance emerge from the shadows. They are accompanied by four American advisors who had been in the country for no more than two weeks. After some short greetings, the soldiers shouldered their 100-pound rucksacks, grabbed their gear and bags of supplies, and followed their guides down a mountain trail to their base camp. They also had some time to grab some food for the horses, as they had been briefed just days before their departure that their means of transportation would be by horse. For most of the team, this was their first time riding a horse, and this added another level of difficulty to the mission. The Plan With boots on the ground, the team of Major Nooch had the task of meeting the Afghan warlord, General Abdul Rashid Dostum. About the same time, another team, ODA 555, landed several miles to the south in the Panjshir Valley and was tasked with linking up with another Northern Alliance force. Task Force Dagger was in full force and Operation Enduring Freedom had just shifted into a higher gear. Several days earlier, at the end of September, the CIA had been deploying a seven-man team to link up with several Northern Alliance forces to get them on their side. The intelligence was slim, and at this time, they realized this would be a special kind of mission. The big goal of this operation was to overthrow the Taliban government of Afghanistan. They were providing a safe haven for all of Al-Qaeda and its leader, Osama bin Laden. They were hoping that, in the process, they could get rid of all of Al-Qaeda while they were at it. The then Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, was working hard on a plan to get troops into Afghanistan as fast as possible. The Green Berets were ultimately the lead ground element for all the forces arriving after them. They would be advising the Afghan warlords they could get in contact with, as well as directing airstrikes on key positions. The intel of General Dostum could pinpoint those positions and the U.S. forces could show their striking powers to gain trust and confidence. They had been fighting the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban for several years now, and for them, the U.S. forces would be a great assistance in their mission. This was great fuel for conversation, as there was a lot of common ground between the warlords and the U.S. Special Forces. Additional units were prepped and geared up. While the Special Forces teams have the primary role at the start of the operation, the plan for the invasion was approved on September the 18th in the White House Cabinet Room. At that time, President Bush said, the war starts today, and so it began. The Afghan Northern Alliance at this point controlled maybe 15% of the country. The rest was in the hands of the better equipped and larger numbers of the Taliban. The first step, identified by General Dostum, was to overtake the city of Mazar-e-Sharif. This city is strategically located in the Darasuf Valley and less than 40 miles south of the border with Uzbekistan. Whoever was in possession of this city historically controlled the gateway to the city of Kabul. This was shown to be a great advantage for the Green Berets, as well as for the Northern Alliance. Now, with the Americans on his side, Dostum could launch the campaign to overthrow the Taliban and regain control of the city. The Mission After a short introduction with General Dostum, the Green Berets had found themselves in small wooden saddles, too small to fit their big frames. As mentioned earlier, the Green Berets were not trained in horseback riding, and most of the team had not sat on a horse ever before. However, Major Nooch grew up on a ranch and had a history of rodeo riding and was an expert rider. There was no time to learn the skills as they were heading into the headquarters of General Dostum, which was up in the mountains, hours away. Awkwardly riding their undersized Afghan ponies, as described by the soldiers themselves, they arrived at their destination completely saddle sore. 
At their arrival, minutes later, Major Nooch and General Dostum were overlooking a valley. Dostum pointed out a Taliban bunker miles away. A B-52 Raider was flying a racetrack pattern several miles up in the sky, awaiting instruction. General Dostum asked the Major if they could bomb it, as this would boost the morale of his troops. Not long after, Major Nooch tasked the B-52 with the coordinates, and it would begin dropping bombs. A 1,000-pound JDAM was dropped and hit the ground. The bunker was missed by about a mile. Several bombs followed, but not exactly on the Taliban bunker. This would be the start of hundreds of airstrikes that followed and marked the beginning of the mission. Dostum and his troops are thrilled about the power and sheer force of the U.S. October 21st, the fortified village of Bishkab. General Dostum's troops were gearing up. About 1,500 cavalry and 1,500 infantry troops were ready to charge. This marked the start of the operation, and they were battle ready. Major Nooch has taken a strategic position after several days of reconnaissance, ready to call in airstrikes on key positions that were identified. As he called in the first airstrike and the bomb dropped, General Dostum instructed the troops to charge. The first horse cavalry charge of the 21st century had begun. The surviving Taliban heavy guns commenced fire after the initial wave of cavalry had traveled roughly half a mile. Men and horses began to tumble on the ground, either dead or howling in agony from their injuries. However, whether it was because the horsemen were advancing too quickly, because the Taliban forces had not ranged their guns, or for some other reason, the defensive fire was not as concentrated or as precise as it should have been. When the remaining riders reached the second hilltop, they came to a halt, jumped off their horses, and laid down suppressive fire for the second wave of cavalry. With the Taliban being overthrown, the remaining troops laid down their weapon and started fleeing. As the battle raged on, the aircraft above were forced to refuel and Dostum's troops were forced to leave the battlefield. In the days after, this strategy would be repeated in the Kobaki and Kapchal cities with great success. Dostum's troops were advancing and working their way to Mazari Sharif. On November 2nd, another unit, ODA-534, landed 25 miles west of ODA-595 and teamed up with Adam Mohammed Noor, another Northern Alliance warlord in the region. Dostum's cavalry, aided by American air power, helped take the fortified town of Baibeki on November 5. Mazari Sharif fell five days later to the united troops of Noor and Dostum. By spring 2002, the arrival of coalition regular soldiers had surpassed special forces engagement. In essence, their job was done. However, it was not forgotten. On March 5, 2004, in a ceremony at the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Museum, sculptor Du Bloomberg presented Deo Presso Liber, a bronze statue of a Special Forces operative on a horseback commemorating the Special Forces service in Afghanistan. This specific mission was the start of the two decades of war in Afghanistan. If you like what we're doing here, please consider subscribing and hit the bell icon to stay updated about our newest videos. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.